anybody told you that they love you today? Three yeses up front, wonderful start. Uh, I want to tell you, if nobody else has, that me and God certainly do. I want you to know that coming in here today. Uh, they're going to be passing out some Bibles right now. Make sure to grab one of those if you need one, and it can be our gift to you. If you don't have one, you can take that home with you as well. My name is uh, Nate Coleman. I'm the pastor of outreach and discipleship here at the bridge. I'm so glad all of you are here. I was going to make a joke about you guys coming out and braving the heat today, but it's actually kind of a cooler summer so far in Bakersfield. But I know some of you may have missed a few weeks as, as you've been off to Pismo like everybody else in Bakersfield over the summer. Um, but we've been walking through this series entitled Good for the Soul. And really throughout this series, we have hammered home this big point. That God isn't merely concerned with changing our behaviors, but that he intends to transform us from the inside out. I think sometimes we get so focused on these outward behaviors. And maybe it's because that's the thing that people see when they look at us. And so we want to look pretty. We want to look good. We want to look put together for everybody. But I also think maybe it's because changing those behaviors is a lot easier than changing that inward idolatry and sin that's leading to all of those bad behaviors. And while God certainly cares about us following his commands in the way that we live and the way that we act, he is also dead set on rooting out every one of those idols and lies from Satan in our heart that lead to those bad behaviors. And so as we move to wrap up this series this week, I want to do two things. First, I want to remind us one more time from the very lips of Jesus just how important this big idea is. Just how important it is from Jesus' own mouth to not just care about those outward behaviors, but to start to dive into that inward idolatry and sin that leads to those behaviors. Something Pastor John talked about a few weeks ago, kind of how we can do that. You see, I want us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is not satisfied with us settling for the appearance of beauty, but that he intends for his bride to be without spot or wrinkle or any such blemish. And second, I want to pick up where Pastor Kevin left off last week, talking about how we can then train our souls through the spiritual disciplines. I want to talk about how can we practically do this? How can we live out this big idea in our lives? How do we practically not just modify our behaviors, but take real and active steps towards heart and soul transformation? And so that's where we're going today. How do we really instill in ourselves the importance of this big idea, and how can we practically be living this out? And so with that in mind, would you open up with me to Matthew chapter 23? Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. This is one of the times in Jesus' ministry where he really seems like one of the Old Testament prophets, really crying out as people have twisted God's commands. And in this particular case, Jesus is crying out against the Pharisees, one of the main sects of Jewish leaders in his day. They've kind of been his opponents, people he's talked with throughout his ministry. And interestingly, this story, this outcry we're about to read, it comes towards the very end of Jesus' life, the last week of his life. And it seems like Jesus is no longer mincing his words towards the Pharisees. We're going to pick up in the middle of this outcry from Jesus. And my sincere hope as we read these words is that Jesus' harsh words here actually stick with you as the reminder of how important it is to not just modify these behaviors, but to go after this heart and soul transformation. So let's read starting in verse 23 down to verse 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you were like whitewashed tombs, 
which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. These are some pretty heavy complaints Jesus levels against the Pharisees. Jesus, he almost has to do this. He has to uh, kind of argue and complain against this pharisaical religious system that has started to care so much about these minute, tiny details that they've really missed the heart of God and why he gave the law in the first place. The first one of these woes that we read, that first little paragraph, really points that out pretty clearly. Jesus gets on to the Pharisees not for their tithing, but for their lack of doing the weightier things. Tithing was a part of the Old Testament law. It was good to do it. It should have been done. But the Pharisees, they started to care so much about tithing, even from the smallest of their herbs, that they had chosen to neglect and not engage in things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. In fact, Jesus' words are very reminiscent of another prophet from the Old Testament, Micah, who was also crying out against the religious elite in Micah 6.8 when he said, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? It's not that the tithing shouldn't have been done. That was a good thing. Just like it's a good thing to clean up these outward sinful bad behaviors. The problem is when you only focus on those things, Jesus says, you're simply straining out the gnat of uncleanness and still leaving that giant camel to infect your hearts and souls. In the next two woes, Jesus' fifth and sixth ones, they give a very similar complaint, which is actually kind of eerily similar to our big idea in this series. You may see where we got it. That the Pharisees, they care too much about outward appearance and not enough about inward transformation. Jesus tells them, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside it is still full of all sorts of sin. Interestingly, Jesus tells them, if you would have taken the time to clean the inside of the cup, inevitably the outside would have been clean as well. It's really a nod to something we've been talking about in this series, that when we work in the power of the Holy Spirit to get rid of these inner idolatry and this inward sin, inevitably the bad behaviors start to go away as well. And Jesus, he almost makes the same point twice when he then calls the Pharisees a bunch of whitewashed tombs, which is just a devastating burn by Jesus. But it is also very practical. You see, like I said, Jesus, he's giving this outcry in the last week of his life, which is right before the Passover. You see, right before Passover, they would have painted or whitewashed all of the tombs in the city so that as the Jews came into the city to celebrate Passover, they wouldn't accidentally touch one of the tombs and so become unclean. Jesus is actually giving this image that is fresh in everyone's minds. As they've journeyed into the city, they've seen all of these whitewashed tombs around the city. And Jesus says, those tombs, they may be beautified on the outside. They may look pretty, but inside, it's still just a bunch of dead people's bones. That's what he says about the Pharisees. You see, Jesus isn't merely concerned with changing our behaviors. He intends to transform us from the inside out. If Jesus were talking in more modern terms, he might have been talking to us about our junk drawer. And don't sit there and pretend like you don't have one. Right? For some of us, it's a junk drawer. For some of you, it's a junk closet. In my house, it's a junk room. But regardless of size, we all have this thing, right? We've, we've gone around, we've Marie kondo we've Joanna gained everything else in our house. It looks all pretty and clean, and then someone goes to reach for that drawer or that door, and we cringe as everything comes spilling out, because we actually haven't cleaned up our houses. We've just tried to move all the real junk to a place that we hope nobody will see, kind of like we do sometimes in our spiritual lives as well. 
You know, when we read a story like this from Jesus, we can so clearly see the faults of the Pharisees, right? When we see Jesus, it makes so much sense. So we villainize the Pharisees, right? They're perfectionists. They never understood God in his heart. It's right for Jesus to just rail against them. I don't think it's enough for us to call the Pharisees the villains in the story because they thought they were the heroes in the story. They weren't going around asking, how can we lead everybody astray from God today? They were asking the exact opposite question. How can we help the Jewish people follow God the right way? Over the past few hundred years, they had seen the Greeks and the Romans destroy their Jewish traditions. And now Jewish parents were giving their children Greek names or Roman names instead of Jewish ones. The Greeks, they had come in and defiled the temple, the holy of holies, and now they were wondering, how can we worship God rightly? They looked back on Jewish history and they saw that the exile, all of these bad things that had happened, they happened because the Jewish people weren't following God's law. And so the Pharisees tried to come up with a solution. What they decided to do is create even more strict rules than God himself. But they did so as a preventative way to stop people from breaking God's law. What they did is they built a fence around God's law. So that if somebody broke one of the rules on the fence, they still wouldn't actually be breaking God's law. Now, if you sit and think about that for just a minute, that actually sounds like a really noble pursuit, a really good thing to do. But the problem came when the Pharisees started to care more about those made-up, minute rules on the fence than things like justice and mercy, and faithfulness. And if we're not careful, we too, all too easily, can fall into this same trap. I mean, just a few decades ago, the very thing that defined Christians was that we said no to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right? We love to focus on these things that we can control. We say to one another, don't drink alcohol. Don't have sex before marriage. Right? Don't gossip. Those are all things that are sin that we have to clean up in our lives, of course. But at the same time, when we focus so much on those things, we never deal with that idol of anger that led us to drink too much in the first place. We never deal with the lust that led us to have premarital sex. We never deal with those idols of greed and envy and jealousy that maybe God isn't giving me good gifts, so I need to go around and gossip about everybody else instead. You see, this is why these words on Jesus' lips are just as important for us to read today as they were for the Pharisees to hear 2,000 years ago. And it's why I hope we actually store up Jesus' harsh words in this section in our hearts as a reminder to continue to press forward, not just doing the behavior modification work, but the real work of transforming our hearts and our souls. But I also know it's not enough to just know the problem we're facing. We also want to know the solution. How can we walk forward and start to actually experience this type of soul transformation work? I want us to leave here today knowing that we can do something about this. Now, of course, that starts with the fact that God is he's given us so much grace, lavished us with it, with us, lavished us with it. He has saved us. He has brought new life into us. And it is his work entirely to transform us and make us new. And yet, we do have some real and active steps we can be taking in this process. Throughout the New Testament, it's the call to renew our minds from Romans chapter 12. To train ourselves in godliness from 1 Timothy 4. To have purified souls by obedience to the truth from 1 Peter 1. See, there are real steps we can take to start to root out these idols and to become who we already are in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, something Pastor Brandon talked about a few weeks ago. And Pastor Kevin, he talked about this as well last week, how we start training our souls, how we take these real active steps through the spiritual disciplines. 
These disciplines are ways that we train our souls. Ultimately, they are things that we implement, practices we implement in our lives to do the things that we cannot do by willpower alone. They help us to do the things we can't simply will ourselves into doing. For example, we can't simply will ourselves into not being greedy anymore. It doesn't work that way. Instead, we have to slowly train our hearts to develop a greater love for the generous heart of God. And as we develop a greater love for God's generous heart, all of a sudden that idol of greed, it starts to get washed away. See, that's how we deal with these idols. We implement these practices that help us to develop a greater love and affection for the things of God. And as we develop a greater love and affection for God himself, we then see all of the idols we've put on the thrones in our heart, and we want to remove every single one of them and put Jesus there instead. That's what these disciplines help us to do. Last week, Pastor Kevin, he started talking about these by talking about the discipline of study. And I want to talk about three more disciplines this week that I think can help us to practically do that. And they are prayer, fasting, and meditation. I'll start with the discipline of prayer because I don't think it needs a lot of explanation. For most of us, it is the thing we do when we are completely desperate, when we feel like we have totally and completely lost control in our lives. It is our Hail Mary pass. The sad thing is God has given us this wonderful gift that we only turn to in our despair. But really, prayer is all about our relationship with God. Prayer is all about the wonderful and amazing recognition that the creator of the universe, the God who speaks to us in his word, also listens to us. That salvation wasn't just some ticket out of hell, but it was the start of a relationship with God. In Psalm 66, 19, the psalmist proclaims, Truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. You see, God is the Father who stops what he is doing, who comes over to you. He stoops and he bends down with a smile on his face. And he takes your hands, his children's hands, in his own. And he listens to what you have to say. See, prayer is all about entering into God's presence, knowing that he cares for you. Knowing that he already knows everything that you need, but still he wants to hear from you. And the more we engage in this discipline of prayer, the more we start to actually understand and comprehend the loving and caring nature of our Heavenly Father. And the more we start to understand God's loving and caring nature, the more we actually start to desire to change. The more we start to desire to change because we start to recognize that God as our Heavenly Father is already treating us as the most loved children in the entire universe. When we start to grasp that out of the gratefulness for the love that God has shown us, that he's already treating us as those loved children, we now start to want to become those loved children of God who look like God in every part of our being. Maybe that kind of prayer, that still seems too big to you. You've only practiced prayer in those desperate moments of your life. But I promise you, the more you do it, the easier it is going to become. So maybe this week when you start to practice that, and I would encourage you to do so, to build that relationship, maybe as you start, you can only get a couple sentences out to God. And it's going to take time for you to build that relationship up with him. But I promise you there are going to come times in the future where it is harder to pull yourself out of prayer than it was to enter into it in the first place. The second discipline I want to talk about is fasting, and fasting is really a natural companion to prayer. Fasting in the Bible, it's often from food, but it can be from other good things. And fasting, it's one of those disciplines that really, really feels like a discipline, especially if you eat the way that I do. 
It's often been presented in kind of this negative light, sort of this almost religious weight we have to carry. And yet, Jesus, he expected his disciples to fast. People throughout the Old and New Testament, they fast for God's guidance, for God's deliverance, to repent of their sins, to grow closer to God, for many other things. Because really, in fasting, what we're doing is we are determining to focus ourselves on God alone. We are removing that good thing like food, and we are replacing it with the reminder of God's goodness. You see, fasting is the cry of a heart that longs to be satisfied in God alone, that wants to strip everything else away for a time to remind our souls that God is the giver of all good gifts. A book I read this week, the author David Mathis, he put it this way. We fast from what we can see and taste because we have tasted and seen of the goodness of the invisible God, and we are desperately hungry for more of him. I remember the first time this really clicked for me. I was actually interning here at the bridge. It was a number of years ago back when I was in college, and I hadn't really gotten or understood fasting up until that point. And that summer had actually been a rough one for me. I I felt far from God. I felt isolated from community, even though I was back here in Bakersfield at my home church. I was kind of just in one of those weird funks of a season, if you've ever had that in your life. And all summer I'd been working towards starting up this VBS at MLK Park, something that we're still involved in today. And as the day got closer for that VBS to take place, I just started to get this overwhelming sense, this feeling that I needed to fast, which I would have never had that idea on my own, so you know that was coming from God. And I got this sense I needed to fast, and I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. And that VBS was three days long. And for the first time ever in my life, I fasted for three full days. What happened there was God did some incredible work. The VBS, yes, it was successful, and kids grew close to God, and that was really important. What was also really important to me in that season was that I grew closer to God through this. I started to want him more. I wanted to see him at work more. I wanted to stop wallowing away in my isolation and despair because I could more clearly see the goodness of God, and I wanted to start clinging to that closer. You see, what I think fasting does is it creates this desperation in our hearts. A desperation that doesn't settle for lesser things. A desperation that will no longer bow to those idols it used to bow to because it wants God and it wants all of him. And that type of fasting, that is something you can start to engage in this week. Skipping a meal and spending that time in prayer, taking a whole day off of eating to spend time with the Lord, or maybe replacing some other good thing with more dedicated time towards spending time with your Heavenly Father and taking a look at His goodness towards you. The last spiritual discipline I want to talk about today is meditation. Pastor Kevin last week, he talked about study, and really meditation is the companion to study as we go to look at God's Word. Meditation is actually pretty simple for us to understand. As humans, we meditate all the time. We think through our grocery list. We ponder why it is that someone treated us the way that they did. We stand in awe as we look at a sunset. I mean, we know how to stop and deeply think through things. We may not always be good at it because we're busy a lot of the time, but we know how to stop and think through things. Meditation, that's a theme throughout Scripture as well. God commands Joshua to meditate on his word day and night. In Psalm 119, the psalmist proclaims, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what meditation is really about. Storing up God's word in our heart, thinking through it, chewing on it, pondering it, even memorizing it, spending time with him in it. And maybe the meditation you've heard of or maybe you're thinking of, it's really all about emptying our minds and becoming free from all of our attachments. And while Christian meditation does sometimes require us taking those tasks and those worries out of our minds and trying to place them here over to the side to quiet our minds, 
Christian meditation at its core is all about putting truth into our minds, not taking it out of it. It's all about learning to store up God's word into our heart and not just read it for the information it provides or for the study of it, which are good things, but to actually start to read God's word so that our souls would be transformed. Thomas Watson, another author I read this week, he said this about how we read God's word. The reason we come away so cold from reading the word is because we do not warm ourselves at the fire of meditation. You see, as we start to engage in this discipline of meditation, what we're really doing is we are rooting God's word deeply into our heart so that we can no longer be swayed. We're allowing God's word to be the fire that sustains our souls on the darkest, the coldest night, to be the light that leads our path going forward. As we meditate through God's word, it causes us to actually better hear and obey what God has to say because we're taking God's word and we're bringing it into our lives. And as we do that, we can now clearly see the idols we've put up that are in the way of God. And we want to also see the hope of victory in Jesus through his word to smash every one of those idols. And you see, this type of meditation, while it also may seem big, is also something you can start practicing this week. It starts as you go to read God's Word. And if you're not reading God's Word, that is the place to start every day. But as you go to read, you read not just for the information or not just to check it off a list, but actually start taking a few minutes or more as you read and ask yourself some questions. What does this scripture tell me about God and His heart? What does this tell me about my relationship to God as His child? What is God speaking to me right here today? What truth is there in this word that I need to be pondering on and chewing on for the rest of the day that's going to influence the way that I relate to God, that's going to influence the way I treat other people? This type of meditation is growing and developing that relationship with God. And really, that's what all of these spiritual disciplines are about. They are all about different practices and ways that we try to help ourselves to grow closer to God. And ultimately, the way that we're going to experience that type of soul transformation in our lives is only as we grow closer to God. And my hope throughout this series has been, yes, that we want to start practicing this, that we want to destroy those idols in our lives, but also that we know that only happens as we start to take steps to grow closer to God. Because as we start to treasure Jesus more and more, we start to love him more as we put these practices into our lives. We're no longer going to want that junk drawer in our lives because that junk drawer simply leads us away from God and we want more of Jesus. That is my hope for us, church. And so as we go to conclude this series, I want to end with a, a story today. A story that I think will really help remind us of the importance of this work, but also remind us of God's power and his place in the midst of this work. And it's a story that actually comes from one of the Chronicles of Narnia books. Uh, It's the fifth book by C.S. Lewis, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in that book, we meet this young boy. His name is Eustace. And Eustace is kind of an evil. He's, He's a bit spoiled. He doesn't work well with others. And in the book, they're journeying on a boat. They're sailing between different islands, and they end up on this island, and everybody goes to work on the boat because it needs repair. But because Eustace is evil and he doesn't think about others, he kind of slinks away. He ditches everybody. And as he's walking around the island, he comes across this lair. It's actually a dragon's lair that is full of treasure, but the dragon inside is dead. And so Eustace is overjoyed. He's found this great treasure. He's so happy, and he's so happy that he actually falls asleep on top of the treasure. And as he falls asleep, he's thinking all of his evil and sinful thoughts about how he's going to use this treasure to get back at everybody else. Well, when Eustace wakes up, he is surprised to find that he has become the very embodiment of his evil. He is now trapped inside the body of a dragon. While that may seem like an awesome thing, Eustace now realizes that he is going to be completely isolated from everybody else in his life. The weight of his evil and his sin, it starts to fall upon him. And he starts to enter into this despair. And he's in this despair for a few days until the lion 
Aslan, the godlike figure of the book, shows up to Eustace. And he tells Eustace that for him to become a boy again, he's going to have to remove this dragon skin. And so Eustace, he goes about trying to do this, and three different times he rips the scales off his body, but it's not enough. And that's where Aslan steps into the story, and C.S. Lewis writes these words from Eustace's perspective. The very first tear Aslan made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. Well, Aslan, he peeled the beastly stuff right off just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only then it hadn't hurt. And there the skin was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker, so much darker, so much more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch. Church, this is my hope for us. You see, I know that on our own, we are all too prone to simply throw off that first layer of skin, that first layer of sin, and congratulate ourselves and think that the job is done. But I also know that by the power of God in our lives and by us practicing these steps to grow closer to him, he can absolutely rip right into the deepest parts of our heart and remove the thickest, darkest, most knobbly-looking idols that we've been holding on to that we don't want anybody else to see. I believe that God can do this work. As we continue to do our part to grow closer to him, we're going to fall in love with Jesus. And as we fall in love with Jesus, I believe he's going to perform transforming work in our lives. Do you believe that, church? Amen. Amen. Let's end today with a word of prayer and some time and worship towards our King. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you. We are so grateful that you are a God who cares so deeply about us. We're thankful for the words of Jesus, even his harsh words towards the Pharisees. And we pray that we can store those words up as a reminder to us to care about what's going on in the inside, our heart and soul transformation as we try to get rid of all sin in our lives. And Lord, we're thankful that we can even have these disciplines to practice and that ultimately they would help us to grow closer to you. I pray for those out here who've, who were maybe thinking about going out and practicing these disciplines that it would come to a place where they no longer feel like disciplines. They'd be so in love with you. They'd be so overjoyed to enter into any avenue of growth that would cause them to, to love you more. We are thankful that you are a God who rips right into the deepest and darkest parts of us and removes the deepest sin and brings us new life. Thank you so much. We love you so much. And we pray you help us to love you more. Amen.